Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to Johns Hopkins Alumni Weekend. I'm Jack Holmes uh, from Johns Hopkins University Press. I'm a longtime staff member there, uh, a proud alumni. I have my MLA degree from Johns Hopkins. Uh, so I'm here both as an alum and as a Johns Hopkins Press staff member. I'm coming to you from my backyard, uh, a few miles north of uh, Homewood campus. It's a really pretty day today. It's a pretty weekend. Yesterday would have been a beautiful day. It was a beautiful day for the lacrosse game. And we're certainly looking forward to having you all back with us in Baltimore on weekends like this. Um, but we're certainly happy to have you with us virtually today. It's kind of amazing that we've all adjusted to, uh, to the necessities of the year. Um, and we hope you've had a good year, that you and yours have stayed safe and well and have managed as well as possible this year. And I'm sure you've taken pride in um, the degree to which research and expertise from Johns Hopkins has had an outsized impact on managing the pandemic this year. Um, Hopkins' name and the experts who, who work here are all over the news and helping um, all kinds of entities, organizations sort of manage and make important fact-based decisions this year. And really that kind of thing is exactly what our program is about today. Um, the Johns Hopkins Wavelengths book series is a wonderful partnership, a brand new partnership between Johns Hopkins University Press and the university's Office of Research. Um, and the aim is to share the incredible work of the Bloomberg Distinguished Professors at Johns Hopkins in just the same way, um, that impactful way that Hopkins expertise has been shared throughout this year. Um, I'm, as I say, I'm a longtime staff member at, at the press and I have to say this is one of the smartest and most exciting things I think we've ever done. Um, this partnership between, um, you know, a publishing house, but also you know, lining for books, the the kind of the experts that are that are at Johns Hopkins. Um, before we uh, we have a wonderful panel today. Before we start with them, there are uh, kind of three housekeeping points. One is just to thank the Alumni Association for putting this together. Uh, if you haven't checked out the virtual uh, website, the kind of the, the website for the Alumni Weekend, it's, it's incredibly cool. Um, but for years and years, the Alumni Association has hosted press authors for events, uh, just like today. We're really grateful for that. All of you alums are a wonderful uh, audience for our authors. And so um, we've really appreciated this partnership over the years. Um, the second housekeeping point is a good thing. It's the discount that you can get from Hopkins Press um, there is a four letter code, H-J-A-Y, as in Blue Jay. Um, you can use that anytime when you buy books directly from the press on our website. There's also a phone number you can call. All that information is on the website. Just Google JHU Press uh, and you'll find us and make use of that discount. The other housekeeping thing for today is that um, I think this is a Zoom platform, but I believe the chat feature has been disabled, but you should see on your screen a Q&A box. So you touch that and you, you'll see a grid open or a, a box open, and then you can submit a question. Um, at around 2.45, I'll come back and we'll read your questions and take as many as we can before we wrap up at three o'clock. Um, so we're grateful to all of you for attending, for joining us today. Um, and we're especially grateful to our panelists. Um, four of the uh, Bloomberg Distinguished Professors with books coming out this year. Um, and those, those folks are the following. Dr. Jessica Fonzo is the author of Can Fixing Dinner Fix the Planet? That book will be published in June. And I think the, the there might be, a, I think Jessica might have just appeared. It doesn't appear on my screen, but if she's waving to you, that's uh, Jess Fonzo. Dr. Lisa Cooper is the author of Why Are Health Disparities Everyone's Problem? That book also appears in June. Dr. Ashani Weera Ratna is the author of Is Cancer Inevitable? That will be published toward the end of the year in December. Dr. Rexford Ahima is the author of the December edition. Uh, also, Can the Obesity Crisis Be Reversed? Uh, those are the four authors of uh, books that are the first four in this series uh, coming out this year. Um, our panel will be moderated and hosted. Um, by the Vice Provost for Research at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Dindy Burtz, and also by the Director and Publisher of Johns Hopkins University Press, Barbara Klein Pope. Um, so we thank the panelists and everybody who's joined us today. And we're gonna begin with some thoughts from Dindy and Barbara. Thank you, Jack. And uh, uh, warm welcome to everyone for joining us this afternoon. This should be an exciting conversation with some of the most uh, 
prestigious and most uh, illustrious uh, of all scholars here at Johns Hopkins University. Really proud to be part of this. Uh, the uh, Bloomberg Distinguished Profession Program was really started off with what was then one of the largest gift ever made to an academic institution. The goal was ambitious. The goal was to recruit then 50 uh, great star faculty who would be working at the interface of disciplines, who would help Johns Hopkins University to really bridge different fields, different units of the university, divisions, uh, schools. And fast forward, that was then, um, those scholars, some of whom are here today, uh, have absolutely achieved that goal of bridging those useful uh, disciplines we need to move forward in new directions for the university and really for the world. Um, it's a very different uh, uh, and various uh, diverse field of research those scholars are engaged in and really exemplify what was then a hope and really a non-realized hope. Uh, we are embarking in even uh, due to the success of this program to a second tranche of recruitment, another 50, uh, Bloomberg Distinguished Professors and um, with that hope to change the way scholarship is done and the way we can bring about uh, innovation, great ideas in health, in scholarship uh, in general, uh, and you're going to hear about this uh, today indeed. Barbara? You muted. Thanks so much, Denise, and, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, I'm going to spend my three minutes talking about the inspiration for the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor Public Engagement and Book Program. So when I started at Hopkins in late 2017, I was having a lot of fun kind of buzzing around the campus and meeting lots of people, and Denise was, was one of the top people on my list to go visit. And I knew from the first sentence that came out of his his mouth in his, in his office that I was in for a really whirlwind tour of, of all the work that he was working on. And the first thing he talked about was this program. And he pointed to his whiteboard with the list of the current Bloomberg Distinguished Professors on it and the number he still had to get and to recruit and to encourage um, either to become a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor or to come to the to campus. And then he started to dig into some of the specifics of the Bloomberg Distinguished Professors and what their work was like. And I really just got so excited about the possibilities. And I was thinking, you know, these professors are so much at the top of their game. They're interdisciplinary. And because they were so far ahead in their career that they might just be willing to take the time to be able to write a book, contribute to a public engagement program, and to really get out there and make a difference with their research. And so I have a deep background in public engagement with science. And so when Denise and I started to talk about this, we, we really started to envision the program that turned into Johns Hopkins Wavelengths. It sounds like it happened overnight. It did not happen overnight. It took you know, a year or so for us to really get, um, get it together exactly what this program would be. So it is a project that pairs science writers with the BDPs and it helps the BDP to, to bring narrative and relevance to public audiences. And together they have written these really wonderful short books and then we're building public engagement campaigns around the professor and around the books so that we can really get the professors and their books noticed. And we're thinking big and collaborating across Hopkins. So we have a full-time program manager, uh, the super creative Anna Burgard, who everybody on this panel knows incredibly well. She lives and breathes this program every single day. And she's now doing some creative work with Peabody where she and Thomas Dolby are working on creating a, um, a student competition to write a score, a science score that we can use in our videos and podcasts around uh, these first four books and for, for all 10 that we're planning um, in the series. She's also working with the science program at Hopkins um, as we assign writers to each BDP. Not every BDP has a science writing at Hopkins um, uh, partner 
but we are working with them and some, some of the BDPs do have someone from that program. So because we really, really care about widening the audience as broadly as possible for these books, well, you can buy um, a, a printed book. We are going to be posting these books for free to read online um, in open access format. So look for that as well. We really want to try to get these books you know, into high schools and, and all across the world. So um, now let's get started uh, chatting with uh, these fascinating professors. Uh, over to you, Denis. Thank you, Barbara. Uh Really looking forward to these conversations. Uh, and to, to start things off, um, Jess, you, the director of the Global Food Ethics and Policy Program at Johns Hopkins University and work with the Schools of Advanced International Studies in Washington, DC, the Burnham Institute of Bioethics and the Bloomberg School of Public Health. You've also lived and traveled extensively for your research from Italy to Ethiopia to Nepal and are a global expert, including roles with biodiversity and the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Tell us about your book's approach to the intersections of nutrition, global food systems, and the environment. Well, great. Thanks, Denny and Barbara and Jack and to Johns Hopkins University Press. I'm really excited for the book to come out, but also to read the other books that I share this this Zoom with, and they look like fantastic titles. And knowing each of, of these uh, BDPs work, I'm super excited to to read um, what they have to say. Um, so my book uh, is called Can Fixing Dinner Fix the Planet? Uh, I think we know that three of the, the most significant problems that face the world in this 21st century are the burden of chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension, Rexford will talk about that, consequences of climate disruption and the massive economic and social inequities that exist within and among nations and populations, which Lisa will probably talk about. All three of these grand challenges are, are very much related to the foods we eat. So our diets are the products of massive interconnected and highly complex food systems that start in farmers in their fields, but extend to complex marketing networks that deliver food to our plate. Food systems though have incredible impacts, substantial impacts on poverty, the planet's natural resources, our nutrition, and the composition of the atmosphere along with social equity. Uh, food systems are also incredibly vulnerable to climate change. We've seen that already, and that will accelerate into the future. So food systems are this nexus between diet, human health, the global economy, and environmental well-being. This nexus brings about many interconnections. And so one has to ask themselves, can we, do we still have the right to eat wrongly? Our diets and what we consume and the decisions we make every day about our diets matter. They matter in this interconnected global world. So in the book, um, I look at the interactions between food systems, diets, human health, and the climate crisis. It takes on a global perspective and draws on my experiences and a lot of my team's experiences and colleagues' experiences working and living in places in Africa, Asia, Europe, and of course in the United States, and describes how food systems must change to slow and reverse some of these uh, quite stark trends that we see. It does really four things, and it's really a, a clarion call. One, it shows that if we take a business as usual path of how food systems have, are, and will operate, we will continue to struggle with negative consequences for both human and planetary health. So we have to make changes. The second thing it does is it provides examples of what we can do to promote healthy, sustainable, and equitable diets, sustain the Earth's biodiversity, and protect the environment on all of the incredible species that we share this planet with. The third thing it does is it raises readers' food and, and environmental literacy and empowers readers to take immediate and long-term changes 
by helping them make informed decisions when they walk into a grocery store, when they walk into a restaurant, when they walk into their kitchen. And last, it calls on global experts, governments, private sector, to make bold changes to food systems and ensure that their decisions are the right ones for humans and planetary health. So um, I have to say, Denny, it was really difficult to write this book <laughs> because you know, you're dealing with big challenges and making them tangible and not so stark and, and full of dread and, and despair was, was a bit challenging. But I, I think in the end with Anna and, and other colleagues, we got there to what I hope is an inspiring book. Thanks so much, Jess. Uh, let me follow up with this. Um, you know, some additional stress points in the global food system have been further revealed during the pandemic and quite covered by the media. What do you think is the best, most likely opportunity for improvement, given the severity and other broader public awareness of some of these problems? Yeah, I mean, I'd be curious to know how the others feel, but it was really strange writing this book in the middle of a pandemic. Because you don't know, we don't know when it's going to end, right? So how do we write about these issues that we all are impact? Every field, every sector, every discipline is impacted by COVID and the pandemic. Mm -hmm. of, of course, the food system is profoundly impacted. Um, you know, shock to the health system has created sh secondary shocks to every other system that we deal with. I think w one of the things that I found interesting is that. Um, you know, a we are all in this together type problem that the pandemic is like that. If one country doesn't deal with it, every country struggles, right? We will continue to have the spread of variants. If one country doesn't get vaccines and people are moving around, you can, you know, you know, you know how it works, right? Um, I, what, what I think has become more visceral is that things like climate change, things like inequities, they too are, we are all in this together kind of problems. If, if one country like the United States doesn't step up and agree to the Paris Climate Agreement, everyone will suffer. So um, I think there is is more attention about how um, these kind of problems are so interconnected. It calls for multilateral cooperation. Um, I think people see the interconnectedness between zoonotic disease, climate, food, health. Um, but what we are still left with is, do governments and food and beverage industries and other industries care enough to make the changes to, to, to realize some of those solutions around climate change? That I'm still wondering. Um, but what I do think is that these global grand challenges are much, uh, there, there's much more attention on them. We have a UN food system summit at the end of this year where mm -hmm. all member states will come together to, to rally around improving food systems. So I think it's a good moment in time and COVID has really shown some of these, uh, issues around food and inequities. So, um, I hope governments actually now take action and, and be bold and visionary and in, in how they move forward in the future. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Jess. Uh, I think we'll uh, go on to, to talk with Lisa next and remember to put your questions in uh, the question box. So Lisa, I, I, I love that your book weaves together your, your personal story and your research. And I want to remind our audience that Lisa Cooper is in the schools of medicine, public health, and nursing. She's a pioneer researcher on the subject of equity in healthcare and the founder and director of Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity and director of the Urban Health Institute. She's a trustee for the Carter Center and an advisor for the NFL's Disparities Committee. So Lisa, I'm surprised you have time to join us today, but thank you given all that you do. Um, so your book covers the timely topic of health equity, and I hope you can take a few minutes to tell us about it. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. And, um, and thanks, Barbara. Thanks, Denise, Jack. Uh, again, it's the, to the JHU Press. It's wonderful to be with everyone today. 
and really excited to hear about the, the books by the other BDPs. And um, I think Jess actually got us off to a great start um, talking about the interconnectedness of, um, you know, the food system and, um, you know, food issues, because it really ties in very well with my topic. Um, so the, the topic of my book is why are health disparities everyone's problem? And uh, I study how racism and socioeconomic factors uh, shape patient care and health outcomes. I also study how patients can become more activated in improving their health. And I study how health systems can partner with communities experiencing health disparities to advance health equity. And so as Barbara mentioned, um, I, um, the inspiration for my work comes from my experiences growing up in Liberia, West Africa. And it was there that I first realized how much opportunity and privilege or the lack of those things actually shapes the course of each person's life. Mm -hmm. And so I became interested in this topic at a pretty early age. And um, so first, you know, I think we've heard a lot of talk about health disparities lately, but just to sort of, you know, make sure we're all on the same page, health disparities are avoidable or unjust differences in health among groups with different levels of wealth or power or privilege. And um, a lot of people don't realize this, but there is an estimated 265 deaths in the United States, this is before COVID-19, that are attributable to racial and ethnic health disparities. And that's the equivalent of a 747 crashing every day. And so I think a lot of people just have not been aware of the impact of health disparities. They are widespread across geographical regions. So not only in the United States, but around the world, they impact people of all ages. They cause premature deaths and they reduce quality of life. They actually cost just our country, the United States, billions of dollars in e each year, just in medical expenditures, as well as other costs that are due to you know, lost productivity. And as just mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic has really kind of magnified these issues for us because we've seen, you know, throughout the media and, um, you know, throughout maybe some of the people that we even know that there's been a disproportionate number of cases, hospitalizations and deaths from COVID-19 that have occurred among people of color. And even as the vaccines have become more available, we know that there's still inequities in access to those vaccines by people living in different communities, particularly in communities of color. And right here in the US, even though half of American adults have gotten at least one of the vaccines, one dose of the vaccines, many people living in middle and low income countries around the world, such as India, will not have access to a vaccine until next year or later. So, you know, there's this myth though, that the poor health that's experienced by people in socially disadvantaged groups is the direct result of poor choices made by individuals. But what we actually have learned um, over many decades of research is that because of centuries of discrimination and social injustice, many people in communities that experience health disparities actually lack opportunities to make healthier choices. And so that's one of the topics that I talk about in the book is what are some of these factors that actually shape opportunities for people to make healthier choices? Things like, um, you know, what kind of food you eat or um, whether or not you're able to engage in physical activity, what kinds of toxins or exposures you might have at work. Um, so my early research though, actually focused more on the healthcare setting. And, and so I talk about that in the book and, my early research focused on why people of different racial and ethnic groups and people with low education or lower levels of income were experiencing poor quality of care. And so what we did was we actually studied uh, relationships between doctors and patients and documented that there was actually poor communication in the visits of African-American patients when compared to white patients. And that implicit racial bias among physicians was actually associated with these negative communication behaviors, as well as patients' ratings of their experiences of care. And so that was my early work. And then I talk about in the book how we've actually moved as a field beyond just describing these problems and to better understanding them and now developing interventions. So about 11 years ago, my colleagues and I established the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Equity. And we focused on testing interventions to address disparities in cardiovascular disease. Now, cardiovascular disease includes high blood pressure and heart disease and stroke. 
And it's the leading cause of death actually worldwide and also in the United States. And it's also the greater, greatest contributor to disparities in mortality. So what we talk about and what I talk about in the book is how we uh, have conducted research to identify effective programs for improving things like consumption of healthy foods among people who live in food deserts, um, improving patient physician communication in primary care, looking at different programs that target physician behaviors as well as patient behaviors. Um, how do we improve blood pressure control among persons of color and people with low income? So we've done that research. We've also trained more than 4,000 researchers and practitioners globally through our uh, academic programs. And we've done this all in partnership with community. So we've really established very strong community academic partnerships and we've used those partnerships to inform all of our work. So our community partners include people from healthcare as well as from community-based organizations and neighborhood groups that are involved in all phases of the research. They help us identify the most relevant questions. They work with us to obtain funding. They help us refine our research procedures and materials so that they are acceptable to recruit study participants, to train our staff and students. And they also co-author research articles and help us distribute the results of the research to their neighbors, colleagues, friends, and also to help us advocate with policymakers for change. And they pro probably most importantly help us to build trust with communities that have many reasons to, to distrust science and healthcare. So what I hope um, readers will come away with from my book is uh, a few main points. First, as actually as Jess mentioned as well, that everyone's health is interconnected within communities and around the globe and that none of us will be able to remain healthy until we're all healthy. And I think nothing has shown us this more clearly than, than the COVID-19 pandemic. Second, equality or giving everyone the same thing will not result in equity. So to achieve equity, we have to give to each person or group according to what they need. Um, the third thing is that changing individual attitudes and behaviors is important, but, and as well as how we treat one another, but our organizational practices and our governmental laws and policies actually need to change to, to facilitate you know, these individual behavior changes and, and to you know, encourage us to engage in, in healthy relationships. And then finally, I guess the main take home point is that each of us can play a role in advancing health equity, no matter what we do and where we are. And I, you know, I'd love to engage in further conversation about what role we can each play uh, in, in advancing health equity. Thanks so much, Lisa. I just have a quick follow-up question. You did mention um, in your your, the points that you want the audience to take away, the difference between equality and equity. And in the world of publishing, we talk a lot about equal access and equal asset access versus equity. And so I wanted to just kind of punctuate this because language is so incredibly important. And for you to give a quick example of the difference between equality and equity so that the audience can, can know what kinds of solutions you're looking for. Sure. So, you know, so I'll start with a, an example that is really not healthcare, but, um, and then maybe apply one to, that's more specific to health. So I guess equality is sort of like giving everyone, like giving a child, a, a small woman and a tall man and somebody who uses a wheelchair, the same bike to ride and saying, here you go, you can use this, you know, to get from point A to point B. It just doesn't work that way. And not everyone would be able to take advantage of that. But if you apply it to healthcare, for me, it's like, you know, it sounds wonderful to give everyone who has high blood pressure a pill box and a blood pressure, um, home blood pressure machine that they can use to measure their blood pressure and that they can use with an app on their cell phone to track that blood pressure and report it to their primary care physician. But imagine if, um, we give the same thing, we give that to everyone, but some people actually um, don't know how to use a blood pressure machine or don't actually have broadband access so that they can take advantage of that mobile phone app. So, you know, so it, it may mean that instead of giving everyone the same thing that we actually, uh, along with giving some people 
the blood pressure machine and the pill box, we actually assign a community health worker to go out and make sure that they know how to use that blood pressure machine well. And that if they're having trouble getting access to their medications, that they can sign up for a special program where the medications can be delivered to their home, you know, or if they need some extra help, you know, getting signed up for better broadband access, they need a voucher or something like that, that they can get that. So we can't just give everyone the same thing and expect them to all end up at the same point because we didn't, we didn't all start out at the same place. Thank you. You know, I, I think so, sometimes I think about that as allowing people to experience equal outcomes. Right. Right. So, thanks so much. Um, over to Denis to chat with Ashi. Thank you, Barbara, and, and, and thank you, Lisa. Really incredibly inspiring. I, I need to read this book. Uh, Ashi, through your Bloomberg Distinguished uh, Professorship role, you've led the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology in the Bloomberg School of Public Health. You've also worked within the Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center in the School of Medicine. Uh, you've done really groundbreaking work at that interface between aging and, uh, and cancer, really how aging plays a very active role in uh, tumor development and progress progression in general, um, especially as it relates to therapy resistance and, and the tumor microenvironment. Really uh, tell us how your book will really exemplify your experiences and your vision, how someday we may manage this disease better. Thanks, Denis. It's been really fascinating listening to both Jess and Lisa. Um, a big thank you to all of you uh, at JHU Press, um, to Barbara, Anna, who's not here, um, and all of you. I can't wait to read these books that are just amazing because they're on such a you know, global scale. I just I feel very humbled by it because all of the connections and connectivity you're talking about at a global scale in my book, they really drill down to the way cells talk to each other. Um, so, um, you know, you're thinking about the way society speak to each other. And I feel so humble because I'm looking at the way tumor cells talk to uh, each other and the way they talk to cells that are surrounding them. And it's fascinating to think about it that way because, you know, really it tells us how important connectivity is, how important these conversations are, whether it's a tumor cell talking to a normal cell and getting directions from those cells or whether it's one society or one individual speaking to another individual and taking away conversations from that. So in my book, um, what we talk about is how tumor cells communicate with the environment around them, how they move from one neighborhood, if you will, to another neighborhood, how they change those neighborhoods for the worse, usually for the worse, rarely for the better, um, and how they grow and co-opt those neighborhoods and corrupt them um, and how they can invade their host and ultimately sadly kill them. Um, Denny mentioned that the, you know, the work that I do in my lab is about how as we age, those conversations between the tumor cells and the normal cells around them change. And where when we are younger, the cells are stronger around the tumor cells and they can hold those tumor cells, those malignant cells in place. As they age, they become weaker and they're not able to hold them in place um, as efficiently. And so those conversations change, the tumor cells get stronger, the normal cells get weaker, and uh, they're not able to keep those cells in check quite as efficiently. And that's why uh, when we look at the rates of cancers in general, in older populations, cancers are more uh, prevalent, the incidence of cancer is higher, the outcome is worse for older patients for many, many different cancers. Um, and this becomes an increasing public health problem because our populations are aging. Um, you know, since the invention, for example, of antibiotics, our, our people are living uh, to much older and older ages. And so as more as the vast majority of people develop cancer over the age of 50, those who die of cancer are over the age of 50. And so as our populations age, um, this public health burden becomes huge. And so um, my work has tried to focus on understanding what it is 
that is that connection between aging and cancer and how we can disrupt it such that the tumor cells are no longer um, able to either co-opt signals from the normally aging cells or escape signals from those cells that would otherwise hold them in place. Um, I think what has been the most surprising for me during my career is how very tricky cancer is. So I talk in the book about how when I first started in grad school, one of the things I learned was that when you give a cancer cell a drug that's intended to kill it, some cancer cells literally build a pump on their surface and then they pump that drug right out. And so it ends up being completely ineffective. <laughs> and they do you know, so many of these things where they co-opt normal processes or they mutate a gene um, and they're able to then survive all of these hits that either nature is trying to give them or we as you know physicians and scientists are trying to give them just to become more aggressive and survive all of these hits and so to manage that we need to understand what we're really dealing with um, what this you know the incredible nature of what this beast actually is and my hope for the future is that you know we have as a field really focused on targeting the tumor right because that's what we see as our enemy that we are trying to attack. But really what we need to understand is how that is communicating with everything that's going on around it as well. And we need to try to disrupt those conversations. So my hope for the future is that we'll not only understand how that tumor exists within its microenvironment, disrupt those conversations, but that ultimately, you know, I don't believe we'll ever cure it outright but I think we'll be able to manage it much the way we manage things like diabetes and hypertension and other chronic diseases. Fascinating. Uh, thanks so, so much, Ashi. I've been, as you know, following your work and uh, each, each paper each is a breakthrough uh, that changed the, the mind of many in your field and beyond. And so uh, we're so lucky to have you uh, as a colleague, uh, me personally, for sure. Um, I would like to ask you a, a slightly different uh, question, but I know uh, you care a lot about. In your book, you speak about the critical role of immigrant scientists, especially in cancer research. As an immigrant yourself who works with many others, what do you see as a chief priority for recruiting and keeping these vital players to fight cancer and conquer other crises? When America alone cannot provide enough of these scholars researchers and other professionals? Yeah, so, you know, that's such an important question, Danu, because yeah, to address, first of all, something you've just said, we do have this myth in America that, you know, immigrants come here to take American jobs. And as you state, it's not the case, and especially not so in the sciences. We just don't have enough people to do the work. And it's becoming, actually, I think it's becoming um, a critical issue right now in the sciences. Um, and I also want to just clear up another myth, which is that immigrants are not, as is commonly perceived, cheap labor. Um, they are required by federal law to be paid at the same levels as all other scientists, as you know, but just to clear that up. Mm -hmm. I think our chief priorities include many of the same diversity initiatives that we pursue for recruiting and retaining our URM scientists in some at some level. We need safe spaces. Um, uh, certainly our Asian American students are at risk right now. I worry about them every day as they walk on the streets. Um, reducing bias, both implicit and otherwise, easing some of the current restrictions on international collaborations that we're dealing with, mm -hmm. creating more vibrant exchange programs, generating early pipelines of international students and so on. I mean, just look at this call. You have the leaders of Johns Hopkins University and. I count at least three immigrants among us. So, you know, I, I would argue this is a pretty important initiative for us. Thanks so much, Ashi. Amazing. Okay, so um, I think it's time uh, to talk with Rexford Ahima. Um, similar to Lisa, Rexford Ahima is in the schools of medicine, public health, and nursing. He's the director of Johns Hopkins Diabetes Initiative and the editor in chief of the Journal of Clinical Investigation. He's a widely respected leader across fields. Uh, his research 
It's at the intersection of metabolism dysfunction and diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular diseases, inflammatory diseases, and other conditions. And we can see kind of a thread through all four of these BDPs um, when we learn more about what each of them does and their interdisciplinarity of their work. So his work contributes um, not just to research, but also to practice in clinical care and education um, in diabetes and weight management. So Rexer will speak to the root causes of the obesity crisis and also touch on some solutions. So Rexford, um, the mic is yours. Uh, thanks, Barbara, and thanks to Denis, Jack, the other panelists, and certainly to our, our attendees for showing up and, and supporting our efforts. Uh, so the, the, the title of my book is uh, Can the Obesity Crisis be reversed. Okay, so the, the, the keywords are all there. So I'm uh, a physician. I'm also a basic scientist uh, focusing mainly on what we call metabolic health. So diabetes, endocrinology, and associated diseases. And the reason I moved from Penn, I University of Pennsylvania after about 17 years to Hopkins five years ago was to move into the area of implementation and advocacy and so on. So it's nice to be in your lab and discover new molecules, but it's one thing trying to expand your ideas to the general population and to help move the field forward. And, and that's, that, that was the impetus for me coming to Hopkins. Uh, this book is unique. I've written many books and edited many books. This is the first book I've had the privilege of uh, communicating directly with the general public, and I really appreciate that. So what's obesity? That's in the title. Uh, the fact is, obesity is a form of, it's a consequence of malnutrition. When we hear malnutrition, we often think about undernourishment, right? On the other extreme, we are overnourished, and that has metabolic consequences, especially if we consume too, too, too much sugars and, and fats and other processed foods. Obesity is characterized by having excessive amounts of fat everywhere. So not just in adipose tissue, in muscle, in the liver, around the kidneys, and even wrong fats in the brain, okay? So that begins to connect why obesity is such a multi-system disease. So all these organ systems I just listed begin to suffer, they age rapidly, and the end results can be things like diabetes, which I spend most of my time studying. So if you're obese, your risk of developing so-called type two diabetes is anywhere from three to tenfold higher than if you're not obese. The rates of obesity are increasing rapidly. So among children in the United States, two to five years, the estimate for obesity is around 10%. And then it doubles from age five to 19 years, it's about 20%. And then among adults 19 years or older, it's about 40%. That's how bad it is. Um, what are the causes? The book goes into that. And I spent some time uh, debunking some myths because there are just so many books out there talking about obesity and so on. Uh, with all due respect, folks like Dr. Oz and Dr. Phil and all these guys, because it's an interesting topic for the, for the public. So what I spent some time doing was going into the facts, what we know about the, the genetics of it, why some people are predisposed and others are not. Uh, the fact that it's often not our fault, just like any complex disease, we don't blame people for having high blood pressure, or high cholesterol and so on. Part of it is behavior, but a lot of it is predetermined, right? So I go into a, a bit of that. And then I also go into diseases connected with obesity. So the traditional ones we worry about are diabetes and heart disease and so on. But the non-traditional ones are things like dementia. So if you're obese midlife, you have a greater chance of developing dementia. If you're obese midlife, you have a greater chance of uh, developing breast cancer or a bladder cancer or um, cancers associated with the endometrium and so on. So all these are interconnected. And the basic thrust there is three key factors, storing fats or lipids in the wrong organs. There's an element of what we call oxidative injury. So somehow these metabolites from fats 
disrupt many things, including the genetic makeup of cells. And then thirdly, there's a component of what we call chronic inflammation. So you put all these together and you begin to see how many organs may dysfunction. You take COVID, for example. We are exposed to COVID. If I get exposed to a patient with COVID, I'm not immune, I'll, I'll, I'll inhale the box and it will go into my lungs. But whether you get hospitalized or you die from the disease has a lot to do with your metabolic health. And, and you begin to see the consequences of it in the United States across the board, people who are overweight or obese are suffering the consequences of metabolic imbalance and how that interfaces with infections, right? Then the last part of the book focuses on whether uh, this crisis can be reversed. And uh, if you're a skeptic, you'd say no, or maybe I'm an optimist. So I tend to say, uh, yes, we can. And the tools are there. A lot is demanded of individuals in an unfair way. I I'll give you a quick anecdote about two presidents. So we, we all know FDR did a lot of great things for the United States. Many of you know he died of a stroke. In his time, he had high blood pressure, malignant hypertension, died of a stroke. Nobody blames FDR of dying of a stroke because he had high blood pressure. And then you have an earlier guy, um, William Taft, who was obese. And he just opened the newspapers and he was a butt of jokes, right? He also died of a stroke. By the way, he lived about 10 years more, longer <laughs> than FDR, right? But he's presented almost like a caricature because again, obesity is seen by the public. You don't see high blood pressure. You don't see diabetes. You see obesity. So it's very easy to point to Taft and say, oh, he was in discipline and all that. No, he was the president. He was the only president of the United States who also became a Supreme Court Chief Justice. Nobody else has done that in the history of this country. So I'm here advocating for the fact that there's a lot to be done for people who happen to be obese and have health consequences as a result of that. Much of the help is going to come from societal input. So government has a role uh, as far as food policies and uh, our environment, our concern, the way healthcare is delivered and so on. And clearly individuals also have a role, but we have the ability to work together to really stem the, uh, the, the, the tide. So in all, that's my take home message for this book, to bring hope, lots of information and really point the way forward. Thank you, Rexford, for that. And, and the question that, um, I just want to, to put, um, to punctuate again, just like we, we did with Lisa, um, language and, and we have um, a book on um, blaming and shaming um, and how, how horrible that is, not just for being, um, having overweight, but for other reasons as well. And could you, could you just say what kinds of misguided and kind of unethical and, and medically uh, misguided um, ways in which you can keep that from happening to, you know, both in society as well as in medicine to, because it is, it is um, counterproductive mm -hmm. to the solution. So in a practical level, how, how do you fix that? Well, I, mean, I think it comes first and foremost from inf information, right? Facts matter, especially in these times and especially with the last administration we had, right? So I think the public have to uh, be provided information that look, these trends have happened as far as obesity is concerned, especially over the past three decades, right? And uh, many people who happen to be obese or normal weight, like myself, it's not really by choice. I don't wake up counting my calories. I almost never do. <laughs> and I don't think most obese people do. We just happen to live in the environment. And because of our genetic predisposition and things we may or may not do, we wind up where we are. So I think people don't realize that basic fact. It's like that for any complex condition. All right? Right. Uh, so that fact needs to go out. Two, the other fact that needs to go out is that uh, you don't have to slim down to your weight in high school in order to be healthy. Mm -hmm. Studies have been done, funded by the government, showing that as little as 7%, 5%, 10% is enough to restore your health. So you don't have to be ideal weight. 
but you can aim towards an optimum or healthy weight. That's what we're talking about. And then thirdly, uh, the, the fat shaming also comes across when people equate obesity somehow with being indisciplined, right? That these people don't have self-control and uh, maybe they're not even intelligent, right? And so, and I've given you an example of Taft clearly was a very intelligent guy, right? And a lot of Governor Christie is certainly intelligent. There are a lot of obese people with obesity with, who, are, who are way out there in terms of achievements and so on. So that part of it needs to be driven in. Mm -hmm. um, the other uh, thing that needs to be addressed is this whole concept of whether there are types of obesity which are healthy and not. And I think that debate sometimes is counterproductive, right? Uh, the, the key thing is, is your weight or body composition giving you the optimum health possible. That's the key thing. So these are all things that need to be, it, it's such a wide open condition that unfortunately we tend to, obesity is the only thing as uh, Barbara, as you know, that you can stereotype and get away with, right? People will jump on your case for other things. Somehow if you have an obese issue, people think uh, you can be picked on. And I think that's, uh, we, we need to address that. We, we, we're all in this uh, together. Thank you. And I think, I think that's a, a through line to all of this, that we're all in this together on all of these issues and finding solutions to them um, through the insights of all of your research. And so I want to turn this over to Jack now, um, who will take questions from the audience. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to all the panelists. These um, are just, they sound like amazing books um, and potentially just amazingly impactful books. So we're we're grateful to you for writing them. We're grateful to uh, you for talking about them today. Um, so here's our first question. Thank you, looking forward to all these books and more. Does the cancer and changing diet and healthcare research look at male and female differences as well? So that sounds like that's for several of you. I can answer from the cancer angle. Um, we have been looking at that in the lab. And um, for sure, there is a lot of research out there looking at male and female differences. We see it down on the very cellular level where we see that, um, you know, we talk about the book, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. And we say that, you know, there are differences that we see in both um, quality and magnitude of changes with aging. In, um, the, in the changes from everything from metabolism to the factors that these cells are secreting. I'll leave some time for my colleagues to answer from their perspective. Thank you. Anyone else for that one? Um, I, I'll, I'll be happy to, to, to jump in. Um, so there, there is quite a bit of research that focuses on disparities in health by gender health and also just sort of experiences of healthcare and, um, you know, lots of work documenting, for example, women at higher risk for uh, conditions such as depression, um, mental health issues, um, whereas men being at greater risk for issues such as alcohol um, use disorder. So there's lots of research looking at that. There's also research where we look at intersectionality, meaning that, you know, we don't, typically we don't all belong, we don't belong in one social category. So depending on who we are, we may be uh, at a uh, high risk for one social group that we belong to, but not at a, for another one. So we look at things like intersectionality. So people who are women, women tend to, to live in, with higher rates of poverty, for example, than men. Um, you know, to, to, to earn less money than men. And so that sort of increases their risk for, for poor health as well. And so if you combine that with some other risk categories such as race or ethnicity, you have the fact that women of color, for example, are you know, more likely to have higher uh, maternal death rates during um, the, peri the pregnancy period and the postnatal period. So we look at a lot of those issues because gender, of course, is one of those um, disparity conditions. And, and we know that even people who are sort of non-binary um, in terms of their gender now are at risk for a lot of sort of stigma and violence and depression and uh, trauma and, that, and those sorts of things. So yes, gender and sex are part of 
of the disparities research equation. All right, I, I'll, I'll you. go next. Um, so, yeah, so there are sex differences in it, normal metabolism and also uh, obesity. So you take um, young people or young adults, um, certainly before the menopause, and a woman, a healthy a woman and healthy man, the men tend to require more energy because they have more lean tissue compared to women. And women tend to have more fat, about five to 10% more fat. This is natural and it's co coupled to reproductive capacity. You see that in humans, you see that in other mammals. The way to estimate how much uh, you actually consuming is if you're a woman, take your weight in pounds, multiply by 10, that's your resting metabolic rate. So a hundred pound woman resting metabolic rate is a thousand calories times your activity index. So that lady is consuming about 1500 calories. If she tells me she's consuming a thousand, that's not physiologically possible. For a man, you take 11 times the weight in pounds because they have more lean tissue times the activity index, okay? So that's as healthy. As uh, women go through the menopause, the fat distribution, which tends to be more uh, peripheral, becomes more central, becomes, uh, begins to look more like a male-like pattern, right? And that's very closely associated with insulin resistance, the propensity towards developing diabetes, uh, cardiovascular complications, and so on. There's another main difference when people show up in the clinic. Women, with all due respect, take better care of themselves compared to their men. I have husbands being uh, dragged to the clinic by their wives because they don't somehow feel they have weight issues. Women care. So a lot of studies tend to enroll more women than men because they care about that. And clearly, I, earlier on, I mentioned the connection between being overweight and some female um, uh, cancer situations, breast cancer, uterine cancer, and so on. There are some equivalents in women, uh, in, in men. So, so there are sex differences, most of it driven by sex hormones, right? Estrogens on one hand versus androgens. Thank you. You know where we have uh, not too much time left there. Here's a question for Lisa. Um, what can local and state medical societies do to reduce healthcare disparities? And Lisa, I'm sorry, uh, if you could answer in about one minute or so, that would be great. Well, I would say they need to be informed about what the disparities are that exist within their region, you know, and who's being impacted by those disparities, work very closely with those communities to identify priorities, and then use uh, that evidence and that information um, to, to basically you know, advocate with, with policymakers. They can help to raise that to the top of the policymakers' agendas and help them identify programs that work. Thank you. And maybe Jess, one very quick question for you. It has to be a very quick answer. I hope it can be. Um, what changes um, to food shopping or cooking could be the most easy to make and most impactful? Um, I think uh, really three things. One is thinking more about the quality of your diet, not so much how far food travels. You know, there's this misnomer that the food miles matter most for climate, but it's really more about the kind of quality of, of, of food. So be thinking about fish and uh, decreasing a bit of your uh, beef consumption. Cows produce a lot of greenhouse gases. Um, a lot of the livestock and the way livestock is raised produces greenhouse gases. On um, food waste, uh, not over shopping, shopping for what you need. Um, and of course, uh, reading labels, staying informed. There's lots of ways to, to small changes you can make every day in your diets, but quality, not distance is one of the big ones that is often um, a, a mistake. So, yeah, but, you know, Thank of course, you. again, it's all within your economic means. There's lots of things you can do if you don't have um, a lot of money at your disposal to sh shop at gourmet markets, but there's small changes you can make every day in how you shop and eat. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I think we are out of time, but I want to thank everybody uh, who attended today. 
Um, please pay attention to these books uh, coming online. The, uh, the first two are out in June. The other two are out at the end of the year. You can look at them on our website. Uh, that's also the place each book uh, has a page on the Hopkins Press website. That's where you can purchase it at that HJAY discount, but it's also where you can link to the um, open access um, ebook. Um, so thank you all very much. Thank you to the Alumni Association as always for hosting us um, and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Um, thanks to you all. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. I want to read all those books. Yes. <laughs> I can't wait. And they're incredibly interconnected. Right? They are. It's amazing. They are. Like aging, diabetes, nutrition, health. They, you need to work together. I think you have to create a whole center. I don't know what it is. And the, the, the membership card is to write a book, apparently. It's just like, you know, then you can get in, into the club. But it's really <laughs> so no clear. So all those things are so intimately connected, not okay. superficially, this, very yeah. intimately connected. This they was are, a great conversation are. about them. And we, we're also in touch. You may know um, Hopkins at Home is a virtual series that's being done. There might be some other opportunities to kind of get together as as you know combinations of authors to kind of talk about it because they do it is it's so incredibly amazing that we're doing this and and they did you know they do hang together so well so thank you all very very much yeah. so there'll be a recording of this that we'll let you know about and make some use of and not quite the alumni association i don't think will have it immediately but they eventually will so thank you all so much for doing this okay. today Rick, thank you thanks, thanks, so thanks, 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 thanks guys bye, -bye. bye. bye.